Okay. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that this session will give you some clues about how all three modules you're studying this term actually fit together. We've got IT services management, that's this one. You're doing IT product design with Dennis, and you're doing databases, aren't you, with uh, Dave Voorhis and others. And this lecture, or this session in the seminar series, helps you to understand how all three fit together using uh, the concept of enterprise architecture, which is the foundation of good systems design. What we're looking at is from last, uh, previous week, not last week, but previous week, uh, we looked at business needs for IT. What is it the business requires? Because without a business need, there's absolutely no point in producing some software. Because even if you are a games creator, that satisfies a fundamental need somewhere. And ultimately, with a bit of luck, you could actually make a bit of money out of it. And we want to answer the question, particularly in the business scenario, how does, how can information technology add value to the business? And this is actually a very, very important question, particularly for office type jobs. It is easy to show over the last 40 odd years how computer technology has benefited manufacturing with automation, all those embedded controllers that make uh, washing machines, dishwashers, microwaves, <coughs> even your humble, for blokes, your electronic shaver, your electric shaver, even your toothbrush now uses IT technology to make it work well. But in the field of the office, where people are using their brains more than their fingers and their hands, it's remarkably difficult at times to identify the real value that's being added by IT. If you go back to the turn of the century, 1998, 99, 2000, around about that time, a lot of research was being done into the field of the productivity gap that they wrote about. People like Paul Strassman, um, Brynjolfsson, and various other people were writing papers about the productivity gap. The fact that in spite of spending huge amounts of money every year, businesses could not demonstrate on the bottom line the profit and loss that all this IT was doing anything of value. If you look at all the big companies around the world who are investing those, that three trillion dollars I mentioned last week into <coughs> IT, not one of them is actually any more profitable today. All they've done is to trade spending on people for spending on IT. Their product profitability is still the long-term average of about 3 or 4% net profit. And that's kind of interesting, that we haven't made things cheaper or more effective or actually made our companies any more profitable. In fact, there's one or two rather bizarre <coughs> charts from back in, around about then, which I think are still true, which show that you can spend $10 a head per person of your employees on IT and $100,000 a head on IT and your profitability, your return on investment is exactly the same. And it varies from positive to negative. So all the way across that spend, although they're, they're the big sort of oval, it's going to be random as to whether you make a profit out of it, you get a benefit, or you make a loss out of it. So the question of does IT value add, to business, add value to business is really a very open question even today. So what I want then to do is to develop an understanding amongst you guys, for you to do some research as to whether 
you can see how to drive the design of service, IT-related services using an enterprise architecture approach to get something that actually will give you value. And one of the reasons I'm going to use the Zachman Enterprise Architecture Framework, which is also pretty similar to one that's called TOGAF, is that it's based around six fundamental questions. The six questions that will help you to find the answer about everything. So what does the architecture do in a, an operational or functioning um, organization? Well, a little, bit, little definition coming from um, Zachman himself. What do we mean by a design? Architecture. In our field, the term architecture, structures and so on, <coughs> apply to both and hardware and or software. <coughs> The point about the architecture, and you can see it in the way that architects work when they design new buildings, is it provides the overall outline of what it's going to do. And the architect will also, from that beautiful drawing, beautiful design, also lead into the fine details of the building, or the fine details of your IT, your software, your data, and so on. It's a logical structure <coughs> for classifying, naming, and organizing, producing the structure of those elements of an enterprise, a business, which are significant, both in terms of managing that organization and for helping you to design and develop suitable systems, which will be adding value to that organization. And you can go look at that particular URL, zipper.com. And you will want to, because you're going to need to do quite a bit of research mm -hmm. to see how you are going to use part of the Zachman Enterprise Architecture in your assignment. It mentioned it is section two or three. But that's what's going to help you work out some of the most critical uh, aspects of this new service you're developing. Now you might ask why I use a framework. Well, one of the reasons is frameworks are sets of good questions. They do not give you the answer directly, but they are there to help you ask the right questions at the right time of what you're trying to do. Partly because our organization is getting ever more complex and complicated. As we go out into the world of big data, we have data coming from all sorts of different places lots of different variety, data that is highly variable, of very questionable veracity. We know from last week that IT is remarkably unsuccessful in being developed on time to budget and delivering business value. A framework of questions helps you to be ask the right questions in the right order helps you to ask all of the right answers, or questions, sorry. <clears throat> but also, and this is where TOGAF is better in a sense than Zachman is because it helps you to do this, it aids communication between different parts of the organization, and particularly between you guys, the technology side, and the business side, who don't talk your language, and you don't normally talk their language but you need to learn their language as well. You've got to be able to talk both ways, to technology and to business. You've got to talk marketing, you've got to talk sales, you've got to talk finance, you've got to talk manufacturing, you've got to talk all of the languages in a business. Otherwise, you will not be very successful, whether as business systems analysts or systems analysts or analytics experts. You need to understand the various business languages. And every part of an organization has its own jargon, its own set of terms, its own language. And you need to become skilled in understanding all of those. And a framework will help you do that. 
You see, part of it is all about business people need to be able to be certain that the requirements that have been captured by the business analysts or the technicians is actually what they really wanted. Without them having to learn our jargon. And we need to be sure that you understand their language and record it accurately so that you give them the right sorts of results. Because you don't have necessarily <coughs> the full business um, expertise that they have. That's why you are what you are, and that's why they are what they are. You each have different expertise. And we've got to marry those together to get good value adding systems. As Zachman in his uh, work tells us, we also need these frameworks to help the senior managers who are the sponsors of almost all IT development to know that they are able to do the governance, the information governance appropriately. We'll talk about this in a couple in uh, the third year in sustainable information and corporate governance. We'll spend a lot of time talking about governance of corporations, the objectives of corporations, and information governance and applying it in the same way as you're going to apply some other different sets of knowledge to this uh, semester in your article. The frameworks tell us also who is responsible. It can identify what sort of needs and responsibilities different parts of the organization have, because it's the roadmap the structure of the organization. The Zachman architecture and most enterprise architecture, there are several, also help you to understand all of the aspects of all of the requirements. That's what these frameworks give you. The questions that help you to ask the right question to get the right answers. And with a little bit of luck, a little bit of application, you're trying to end up with a, an organization which is going to survive long term in the future. Not just to burn through all of that initial money that you've got for your startup idea, and then, oh dear, it didn't work. Sorry folks, no, no return on your investment. This is to gain, aimed to help you to move from that and de develop on and on and be become successful and to survive long term. So the first thing you're going to have to do in a little bit, not just now, because not everybody's connected, but this um, afterwards in the um, two workshops this, uh, this afternoon and Friday, uh, Friday evening, or this evening or Friday evening, the first thing is to start finding lots of sources that help you to understand the Zachman Enterprise architecture. And you will need to capture the full Harvard Standard reference for each source in your working bibliography because as you'll remember from the article specification, you will be using the Zachman, Zachman Enterprise Architecture as part of your assignment. So you're going to need all of these references. The Zachman framework <coughs> is a nice little grid, and we'll see it in a minute, if you're not already following it on your screens, and one or two of you might be, but it doesn't matter. Across the top, the x-axis, are various aspects of the way an organization works. And then the y-axis, along the vertical one, gives six different perspectives, from the very top down to the very detailed technicality. The y-axis is looking at the context, the overall context of the whole thing from what it call, what Zachman calls the planner, the person who is trying to put the whole thing together in its context, in its structure. That's the scope, level one. Level two is what's called the business model. It's conceptual, not contextual, but conceptual. And it relates to the questions that the business owner wants to have asked. That is 
the business, the sponsor of the uh, project itself. Typically, a senior manager or a director who wants this project undertake, undertaken. So those that layer asks questions from a perspective of the business owner, which help us to understand conceptually what's going on. The next level is the system model. It's a logical structure of the system, and it's owned by the designer who takes a conceptual model, the requirements, and turns it into the design, the logical design. Below that, you have the technology model, the technology layer. This is where the physical structures of things like databases, the physical structure, the software, of the computing equ equipment, the networks, the servers, the data stores, this comes in at the technology model level. And these are the builders, the people who are skilled at coding, at creating databases and data tables and so on and so forth. And then below that, we actually have another level, the detailed representation, which is the specifics. And this is where you get out to maybe have subcontractors sub coming in to do tasks because you don't have them, level five. Now, this module, IT Services Management, is based around these two levels. IT Product Design with Dennis takes some of that and you're looking at particularly the system model. And then in databases, <coughs> you're taking that and turning it into those ones, the technology model and the detail representation. So we happen to have put together the program for you, well, we did it by design, in fact, so that you have the entire system stack right from the very top, the scope and the business model in <coughs> IT services management, linked to the system model and the interfaces with IT product design in, with Dennis, and then down to technology model and detail representations in databases. So you can see how the whole thing fits together. Now, we don't link the assignments together so that this module gives you a system design that then you spec through with uh, Dennis and then lead on to um, database design and programming and so on. That would mean you would be split over three months or three semesters, which doesn't work. So we want you to be learning about all three areas in the context of how this lot all fits together in a typical uh, project. Now, across the top, you have six areas, six aspects, about the data, the function, the network, the people, the time, and the motivation, otherwise known as what, how, where, who, when, and why, the six basic questions. Because you need to know what the information is or the data is, you need to know what processing has to be done, the function, you need to understand the connections, both in terms of the communications network you know, the network and the security kind of stuff, but also how people relate to each other, how the workflow relates, where the work goes, what the where the information goes. These are all critical. So the network tells you how the, the organization, the people and the systems, the data are connected together. Then you understand through the who question, the people across the organization. And they all have different questions at each of those six, five levels. The when is about timing. You see, if we look at various types of systems, sometimes they only run once a year at the financial end of year period for a company. Others run daily, all the way through. Others run continuously. If you think about Amazon, for example, those sections which collect orders from us and then satisfy those orders out to us by delivering stuff. Those just run all the time. It doesn't matter what time of day it is, it's just still is happening. 
but they will have end of month and end of year accounting stuff. If you think about your lives here at the University of Derby, there's stuff that happens at enrolment in early set or mid-September. There's stuff that happens towards the end of the semester when you start having to stu uh, submit stuff to turn it in. So I wouldn't like to be the, pe uh, per the person who runs turn it in because I know there that at the end of or the middle of December for U U uh, university in the, the UK, every single student who's been registered on it is going to be submitting stuff around about two week over a two week period. So I have to then ramp up my resources enormously so that I don't have a failure. Well, actually, I've not done that terribly successfully for the last four or five years. They're still getting a little bit caught short. They're getting much better, admittedly. But there are still times at the end of semesters where things don't actually have quite enough capacity. And you guys kind of get locked out at times. Or we, as academics trying to mark your work, find it difficult to get in because the capacity isn't there. And yet, at this time of year, they need almost no capacity at all, probably, because no one's submitting anything of any significance. But just imagine you've got 20,000 students in Derby, Derby University, just pouring stuff in in those two weeks. And you've got all the other students in, in the UK pouring stuff in pretty much those two weeks. So time helps you to understand the sizing of your resources you need at different times of the day, different times of the week, different times of the month, different times of the semester. And when I was at Rolls-Royce, it was amazing. You could see at 9 o'clock in the morning on our SAP systems, there was a huge rise in, in resource requirements. Went up to sort of 60, 70 percent of the capacity of the system for about five, ten minutes. Everybody logged in and got organized. And on a Monday morning, it was even bigger because they were doing time, their time recording of what they did the previous week. And then about 15 minutes later, the load dropped by something like 50 odd percent, which it stayed at pretty much for the whole day and then dropped off at about 4 o'clock, 4.30. And it, on a Monday it was very high, Tuesday a bit lower, th Wednesday a bit lower, and so on down to Friday where all the resource levels were much lower. And that was a sequence. <coughs> and then the final thing is motivation. Why is it we need to do this thing? It's to do with strategy, for example. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this bit of processing? Why do we need this data? What's it, how's it helping us? Whole set of questions. And you'll be able to get hold of this very easily when you go to zipper.com, you will find this PDF. And you can see data, function, network, people, time, and motivation. What, how, where, who, when, why. And you'll see all the way through here the detailed questions that each of those levels helps you to understand and to ask the right questions. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I'll go through a little bit of it to help you understand. <coughs> now, there's a really great book, and it's, it's mentioned at the back of this, by... Somebody O'Rourke, I forget his uh, uh, Christian name. It's about that thick. It's a fin very good book. I read it through a couple of times. And it's rather interesting about what it says about enterprise architecture, about business planning. And one of the, and I'll give you some examples of the where, the why, the who type of question. <clears throat> now, when the Great Pyramid was built, Best part now, four and a half thousand years ago. <coughs> a couple of the interesting questions here, given this was a successful building that stayed pretty much intact right through those 4,500 years. The reason why is kind of interesting. Just because the Pharaoh was counted as a god, that's why we we're going to build this enormous thing that was going to use up huge resources from the king or from the Pharaoh resources. It was the culture. The pharaoh was going to die. He needed a tomb. And it was, great to have, it was important that he should have a great pyramid. That was what the culture said. 
because that was going to help him with his life in the afterlife, as it would seem. Now, the interesting question about, this, about the who, 25,000 volunteers worked on this thing for many years. And in today's terms, the interesting thing is all about human resource management. Did you know that we had HR 24, uh, 40, uh, four and a half thousand years ago? But they did. They had 25,000 volunteers who needed all sorts of organization, project planning. Project planning, did you know that we have, as humans, we've known how to pro project manage giant projects for four and a half thousand years. It wasn't invented in, 19, in the 1950s with the space programs. Okay, so we'd invented PERT networks and critical path planning then. But they understood the principles of planning resources and tasks four and a half thousand years ago. Because, you see, they needed roads to be built. They needed people who could cut stone in great many-ton blocks. They needed people who were able to transport these both on the rivers, on the River Nile, from where they cut the stone right to where they were in Giza. They were, had to do things like moving earth. Today, if we want to get a perfectly flat foundation, we use laser technology, and you know bulldozers <coughs> guided with lasers. When they built this 4,500 years ago, they had the ability to create a perfect, optically flat foundation for their pyramids. They didn't use gravity because that would have curved enough over the 100, 200 meters length that it wouldn't be flat. It would be curved with the curvature of the earth. They could get it flat. Some more aspects of the who. These are all classic HR type planning problems for people that you have to get right, right at the top of an organization. Where are you gonna find your workers? Because Giza is in the middle of the desert. It's not where people naturally live. So they come from somewhere else. How are you going to get them there? What are you going to use to pay them? What about living accommodation? Because they come in the right part of the year from where they live and grow their food and their families are. And they've got to get from somewhere up to Giza the desert. So they've got to live. Are you going to build some accommodation? If so, how, who's going to do it? Where? How much is it going to cost? How are you going to feed them? 25,000 people takes a lot of feeding. I mean, any, how many of you are mothers? Vera, you got a child? Yeah. Where? Yeah. No, yeah. You got a child, have you? Yeah. Not yet. Ah, right. But children eat an awful lot. I'm just thinking about how much you eat. And so denude your family's uh, larder at night time when you're feeling a bit peckish. Does your mum come to you and say, Oi, stop it. They do sometimes. Then you've got logistics management. You know, you're moving lots of people, you're moving lots of food, you're moving lots of building materials, lots of logistics. Where are you going to stack the stuff? You're going to do just in time and deliver that block from the quarry along the river, up the roads, up to Giza, and then straight into place, or we're going to stop it, stack it somewhere. We've got a sort of a storage area. You've got two and a half million blocks of rock that you're going to build this thing out of. And they're five foot by five foot by six foot. 150 cubic feet. Close on... Cubic feet each, which 
which is no, it's going to it's quite seriously heavy. It, there, those are several tons each. You've got to make sure the right shape, right size, arise at the right time in the right sequence. And you've got to have the top guy who's managing the whole project and a whole series of tiers of management that you've got to coordinate. An enormous number of people issues to think about as you set out the scope of this enormous project. It's not on the floodplain, which is where people live and where people grow everything. It's up. If you were thinking of building something, you would try to build it near the quarry, which is where the stone comes from, not in the middle of a desert. So there's, I forget how many meters above the river it is, quite a lot. So you've got to do all, of, build all of this lot. And it's not just a matter of the accommodation of where the and doing the quarry and having the ports on the river and building some roads. You've actually got to go and build a whole lot of boats as well. Quarter of a million granite blocks, sorry, two and a half million granite blocks, 100,000 limestone blocks which go on the outside because they're a nice colour. And then on the very outside, 25,000 alabaster blocks which are beautiful and shiny and white. And then who knows how, how much in the way of tools, chisels, hammers. A staggering number of questions about what. And you've got to, in terms of management, you've got to schedule all of those resources. You've got money to control. These are things we thought we invented in the 20th century. They were doing this four and a half thousand years ago on a scale that we would still be challenged even today. And they had blueprints, they had production orders, they had production schedules, they had program management. All the usual things we now know we need, little steps and fine detail. They'd got it all four and a half thousand years ago. And the final, I think it's the final one, the when, the timing. Well, they had to do it before the pharaoh died. They gave themselves a fixed time scale of 25 years. Now, in terms of building projects in the, nowadays with all of our computer controls, computer-aided design and everything else, just like IT systems, most building projects do not come in on time especially for something this complicated and this big. They did it all. They invented the concept of an event in project management terms, something that has to be completed. And to, that gives you an idea of the scale and the scope of that top level. That is what the planner has to think about to come up with the overall scale and scope and the ideas and reasons for the project and the cost and the time scale and all the other resources. So the planner perspective essentially is getting the right people in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons at the right cost. Now you might have seen that justification before as a governance question or governance principle. Now let's go down, what it illustrates the owner's perspective, the second level, the context. And we can see from Coca-Cola a little bit about what this really means, how we can interpret it back into the sort of ideas you'll be thinking about in your assignment. <coughs> so the where question was, well, we're not going to make all of it ourselves. We're going to franchise out the outlets. We're going to franchise out to the bottlers. We won't bother ourselves with turning a small amount of concentrate into the, the diluted stuff that then goes into bottles and then sell it. Now, that's much too hard work. Let's get 
People out there, we will give them the sell them the concentrate. They will buy the right to, to dilute it, to bottle it, and then to sell it. And in 2001, worldwide, Coca-Cola sold 720 million portions in a day. Tins, cans, glasses, and so on. What happened post um, the Vietnam War was when the vets came back, Coca-Cola had a look at a new thing. Because after Vietnam, the late 60s and then into the 1970s, supermarkets really started taking off. They started growing very fast. People like Walmart in the USA and Tesco's and so on here in the UK. And what they then did was they found a new recipe and they thought about other ways of getting the franchisees involved. The what of Coca-Cola is very simple. The trademark of Coca-Cola and the intellectual property rights of the recipe. That is the thing that headquarters Coca-Cola is all about. What is the recipe? And we're going to make that. We will not let anyone know how the Coca-Cola concentrate is made, and that is protected incredibly carefully. Just like the KFC um, <coughs> recipe is also kept secret. And you'll see this in quite a lot of foodstuffs, where the recipe is what's important. Then it's franchised out to other people to produce the saleable product and to then sell it. One of the things that Pepsi, uh, Pepsi then caused was Pepsi-Cola came in to try and get in on this incredibly profitable market. So we then, they then had their own recipe that they kind of made similar in flavor to Coca-Cola, but they couldn't do it exactly because no one knows what the Coca-Cola recipe is. It's held in a safe. And this, you can see the same all around the place. So the owner is thinking about different sets of questions. These are questions that the planner is thinking about. Then we come down to the next level, the third level, the design. Now, here we change tack slightly. We're thinking about what's important about the people who lead that design level. We need to think about the type of people who are designing and leading, because they are the ones who, beneath the owner, have to turn the owner's vision into something effective. And so if we think back to the assignment, you've got to come up with a new service using IoT-based data. It's of difficult and uncertain veracity, and you're now trying to put yourself into the position, first of all, of the planner, and then of the owner to come up with an interesting and seriously valuable service that you can create. And then once you've come up with that overall vision and architecture scope and the owner's perspective, you then need to step down a little bit to some of the areas here. You've got to have those good ideas. You need to go and bounce your ideas off your colleagues here. That's why in the workshops we expect you to discuss your ideas. Because then you can help each other to get better ideas. And then better assignments, better articles. Now, if you are doing this sort of stuff, you need to be able to understand people. You did people, uh, people and organizations last year, didn't you? Yeah. Think about what sort of insights you gained from that module that will help you to understand people more effectively. Now, you all did I's introduction to computer science last year, I think, just about. Do you remember that, that I think it was week nine, on the questions of per people? And um, where I talked about male and femaleness. Because that was not about gender, 
That was about understanding yourself and how you think and how other people think in all sorts of different ways. So go back to the video of that session or the presentation and think about what you learned about yourself, how you communicate and perceive and hear and listen and concentrate on things, and how other people do that. Because that will give you insights into understanding people. That was why that session was there. It was <coughs> alongside people and, people and organizations. Now, one of the questions you then have to think about is the balance between the owner's resources against the needs of the design. Balance. Because the design will always end up costing or containing more resources than the owner wants to spend. Now, as comes out of those reports from the Standish Group, if the owner has too much influence in constraining the resources that go into a project and constrains the time scale too much, we know from bitter experience that all of those projects are going to be challenged. They will be late, they will be over budget, and they will not deliver the business value that was a hoped for and planned for. So there's an interesting tension between what the owner wants to commit and what the designer says is absolutely required to meet the owner's needs from the top end, the planner. So the designer and particular program manager has to strike a really interesting balance through this. And then as you go through the project, yeah, progress reports, status reports on expenditure and so on. All this comes out through the designer there. Now, a thought, and this goes back for a lot, quite a long time, and I've noticed this particular feature now for the best part of 25, 30 years now. And we see it real big time with things like British home stores, which was sold on, picked up for quid, and went into liquidation less than a year later. And the entire and the pension fund has kind of evaporated. Where are the leaders who are taking the ethical high and moral high ground? Well, certainly not there, certainly not in many of the big banks involved in terms of credit crunch, in terms of the PPI mis-selling over the last five, ten years. All of the other things we see in the press about financial services and the huge fine. You know, our, uh, Deutsche Bank is uh, probably going to have to pay something around $14 billion for things that the American courts are saying they did around the um, mortgage. And various banks are being fined huge amounts in the, in the fives and tens of billions for things where they didn't take the moral high ground. In the book on page 128, this is brought out rather clearly. And what we're seeing is at the moment, and I've seen now for the best part of 15, 20, no, 20, 20 odd years, the problem that if leaders ask, is it legal, then they almost certainly know that they are kind of on thin ice. If they ask the question, how do I make this legal, then they know that they're in deep water and need extracting. Now, one of the interesting things, back in 2002, the chief legal counsel and one of the senior executive VPs of the World Bank had published just before he let, finished his 10-year stint there, he published three tomes, each of which about that thick, about various parts of his job as the chief legal counsel for the World Bank. Now, you might think that the, a legal, the chief legal counsel is there to provide advice 
to the senior, the, his peer group, the seniors, about how they should be behaving, what they sh can and can't do. In other words, using his professional abilities as a lawyer to go over a planned course of action and say, well, actually, guys, don't think we can do that. You need, you can't really, it's not allowed. But he wrote in one of the articles that in his 10 years, roughly, at the World Bank, at no time was he ever asked for his professional advice. He was only ever asked, this is what we are going to do. Now, use your legal expertise, your knowledge of our charter, and all sorts of other things to demonstrate why this decision we have already made is legal. This guy was a guy called Ibrahim Shihata, and he was an incredibly um, great lawyer. Um, and I know that, that what he wrote there is true because I talked to some, I know someone here at the university who kn knew him very, very well. Very, very eminent lawyer. Now, interestingly, I have seen the same sort of behavior in other organizations. And there's one organization I know of where you could ask the people, your, your peer group, a question like, um, you know, here's a lottery win. What are you going to do if you win it? And I asked this question with some of my colleagues once, around about 2000. And most of them said, in the current climate there, they would leave immediately. It was a little bit scary that one or two of them said that they wouldn't even bother to tell HR or their manager that they just won the lottery at the weekend. They would just sort of stay at home and go and do something interesting and leave HR or the manager to phone them and find out what was happening. However, the truly scary answer came from two professional accountants. One a management accountant, one a financial accountant. And these were two guys very, very near the top of their organisation. And they said, with that cushion of five, ten million dollar, uh, pounds, I can now do my job as I professionally should. Meaning, they were not going to do that. All that they were being asked time and time again was, this is what we've decided, tell us how to make it legal in accounting terms. Because that was what they were doing. They were never being asked, you know, is this a good course of action? Is it, does it meet accounting principles? They're always t being told, this is what we've decided, now find the accounting principles that make this feasible and that we will not get into trouble in the law. What was even more interesting to me was that one of them said, and I will tell the company that this is a situation. The other one said he wouldn't, he would just do the job as he was. And the one who would tell them was going to essentially say to them, guys, I can afford now to do what I professionally should. Are you going to fire me? You're going to, there's a dare for constructive dismissal. Not that he wanted the 20,000 quid or whatever that he'd get from the tribunal, but he wanted to make the point that this is unacceptable behavior. But still, that's what happens to most professionals. Make legal what I've already decided. Don't bother to give me advice because you'll tell me why I can't. And I don't like that answer, is what they say. They want to do, make their decision and then have it blessed by the professionals. As a question about this leadership and ethics side that comes out at the designer level, people like to balance costs, risks, and the law. And there's an example given in the book, is a mythical oil shipping company. And if they empty out the bilges, which is the water that collects at the bottom of the boat, it tends to get very oily. They're supposed to do it in port, which means they've got to connect up to the pu pipes and pumps and pump it out. And maybe it costs $75,000 or a lot more, perhaps, if it's a big one. 
If you do it at sea, hey, let's just make a little bit of a sort of mess on the sea and birds are going to get oiled up, but hey, who cares? Because I'm not going to spend that $75,000. The law, the maritime law says you must pump the bilges out in port where it's properly captured and cleaned up and so on. If you, do, if you get caught doing it at sea, the penalty may be, say, $100,000. And if you're out at sea, <coughs> the chances of getting caught are, okay, one in a thousand. Call it, I'm not going to get caught. <coughs> so if you do the game theory, multiplying up risk and so on, it is entirely obvious you do it at sea, because you're never going to get caught. If you do get caught, you are incredibly unlucky. But let's do it at sea, because it costs us nothing. And if we do it at what, actually in port, that adds an extra day to us <coughs> and so on. <coughs> this comes back to, again, things you see in ISO 27002, the I uh, Information Security and Information Governance um, stand, uh, standards, <coughs> where the second pillar of uh, information governance is compliance with all external laws, regulations, and so on. All those regulations that affect what we should be doing. And we're seeing an awful lot of companies these days who say, oh, well, if I can, don't get caught, I'm not going to bother with that piece of law, because it costs me too much. And that, I think, is a great pity. Now, what I've covered there are the three layers that are of interest to you that you should be thinking about using during your assignment. But they also help you to understand that relationship between this module, writing product design, and then data bases. And it's a Rourke Fishman, Selkoff, uh, Enterprise Architectures using this document. There, there are copies uh, in the library you can get hold of, go to zipper.com, and there's also a book by Wendy Robson uh, called Strategic Management in Information Systems, which is it's an old book, but it's still got a lot of sense in it. It's all sorts of interesting stuff that will be relevant in developing IT services. So that's that bit. And then introducing what you're going to be doing in the workshop tonight and on Friday night. <coughs> so, What you will be doing in your workshop in the labs upstairs is to understand di two different ways of looking at enterprise architecture. Because although, as I said, TOGAP is kind of related to the Zachman architecture, it's slightly different. It has different objectives, different approaches, different mechanisms. Thank you. So, that's what your objective will be during the workshop. Following on from the question at the beginning of the seminar materials, find, this is your research, learning by research. Find a whole range of good sources wherever, except in the wikis, no wikis, no pedias, no whatever, proper sources. Zipper.com is a good source, Togap uh, .com, I think it is, is a good source, and others. Look for academic ones through Google Scholar, through um, ACM Digital, through EBSCO, and from Emerald, and other academic sources. Find, about, find out about those two architectures. There's all, there was, once upon a time, it might still be there, a Microsoft document which compares lots of different approaches to enterprise architecture. It may still be alive, that's for you to find out and tell me. If that one doesn't work, find another one that does, or maybe several. Build your working bibliography, properly reference and cite it. 
As you work through it, think about what, what these sources are saying about the different enterprise architectures and see for yourself or work out for yourself why you will be using the Zachman Enterprise Architecture for your assignment. So the questions are why and how <coughs> will you use the Zachman Enterprise Architecture for your design task in your coursework, in the article? Because it's built apart, I mean, the fact that it's in the question is not the right answer. You've got to actually justify for yourself using your understanding of these frameworks. And then next week, we'll be able, if you've done all this work, then we will be able to have a session here before you go to your workshop where you draw together some of your ideas on that. Now, the purpose, of course, is there's about 25 of you here. 25 of you doing separate research tonight, Friday night, and during the week. There's 25 different approaches to that question. 25 potentially different sets of resources that you're going to collect. And so as we have a good debate, if we can, good discussion, sharing of ideas, you know, you're ending up with many more ideas than if you just concentrate on your own work. Sharing ideas, collaborating and communicating Build your skills as well, but it means that you have more information at your fingertips to write a really well justified article. So don't just stop at the end of this tonight or Friday night. Keep doing it during the week, folks. You've got a lot of work to do. So we can have a discussion on that question, but you need to not just say, I believe this. Why? Give us the reasons and the evidence, the citations, that will support your argument, your analysis. <coughs> so that's what you're going to do this evening and on Friday. Any questions? 